The Prevention of Literature About a year ago, I attended a meeting of the PEN Club, the occasion being the tercentenary of Milton's Areopagitiza, a pamphlet, it may be remembered, in defense of freedom of the press. Milton's famous phrase about the sin of killing a book was printed on the leaflets advertising the meeting, which had been circulated beforehand. There were four speakers on the platform. One of them delivered a speech which did deal with the freedom of the press, but only in relation to India. Another said, hesitantly, and in very general terms, that liberty was a good thing. A third delivered an attack on the laws relating to obscenity in literature. The fourth devoted most of his speech to a defense of the Russian purges. Of the speeches from the body of the hall, some reverted to the question of obscenity and the laws that deal with it. Others were simply eulogies of Soviet Russia. Moral liberty, the liberty to discuss sex questions frankly in print, seemed to be generally approved, but political liberty was not mentioned. Out of this concourse of several hundred people, perhaps half of whom were directly connected with the writing trade, there was not a single one who could point out that freedom of the press, if it means anything at all, means the freedom to criticize and oppose. Significantly, no speaker quoted from the pamphlet which was ostensibly being commemorated. Nor was there any mention of the various books that had been killed in this country and the United States during the war. In its net effect, the meeting was a demonstration in favor of censorship. There was nothing particularly surprising in this. In our age, the idea of intellectual liberty is under attack from two directions. On the one side are its theoretical enemies, the apologists of totalitarianism, and on the other its immediate practical enemies, monopoly and bureaucracy. Any writer or journalist who wants to retain his integrity finds himself thwarted by the general drift of society rather than by active persecution. The sort of things that are working against him are the concentration of the press in the hands of a few rich men, the grip of monopoly on radio and the films, the unwillingness of the public to spend money on books, making it necessary for nearly every writer to earn part of his living by hack work, the encroachment of official bodies like the MOI and the British Council, which help the writer to keep alive, but also waste his time and dictate his opinions, and the continuous war atmosphere of the past ten years, whose distorting effects no one has been able to escape. Everything in our age conspires to turn the writer and every other kind of artist as well, into a minor official, working on themes handed to him from above, and never telling what seems to him the whole of the truth. But, in struggling against this fate, he gets no help from his own side. That is, there is no large body of opinion which will assure him that he is in the right. In the past, at any rate, throughout the Protestant centuries, the idea of rebellion and the idea of intellectual integrity were mixed up. A heretic, political, moral, religious, or aesthetic was one who refused to outrage his own conscience. His outlook was summed up in the words of the revivalist hymn Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. To bring this hymn up to date, one would have to add a don't at the beginning of each line. For it is the peculiarity of our age that the rebels against the existing order, at any rate the most numerous and characteristic of them, are also rebelling against the idea of individual integrity. Daring to stand alone is ideologically criminal as well as practically dangerous. The independence of the writer and the artist is eaten away by vague economic forces 
and, at the same time, it is undermined by those who should be its defenders. It is with the second process that I am concerned here. Freedom of speech and of the press are usually attacked by arguments which are not worth bothering about. Anyone who has experience in lecturing and debating knows them backwards. Here, I am not trying to deal with the familiar claim that freedom is an illusion, or with the claim that there is more freedom in totalitarian countries than in democratic ones, but with a much more tenable and dangerous proposition that freedom is undesirable, and that intellectual honesty is a form of antisocial selfishness. Although other aspects of the question are usually in the foreground, the controversy over freedom of speech and of the press is at bottom a controversy over the desirability, or otherwise, of telling lies. What is really at issue is the right to report contemporary events truthfully, or as truthfully as is consistent with the ignorance, bias, and self-deception from which every observer necessarily suffers. In saying this, I may seem to be saying that straightforward reportage is the only branch of literature that matters. But I will try to show later that at every literary level, and probably in every one of the arts, the same issue arises in more or less subtilized forms. Meanwhile, it is necessary to strip away the irrelevancies in which this controversy is usually wrapped up. The enemies of intellectual liberty always try to present their case as a plea for discipline versus individualism. The issue, truth versus untruth, is as far as possible kept in the background. Although the point of emphasis may vary, the writer who refuses to sell his opinions is always branded as a mere egoist. He is accused, that is, either of wanting to shut himself up in an ivory tower, or of making an exhibitionist display of his own personality, or of resisting the inevitable current of history in an attempt to cling to unjustified privileges. The Catholic and the Communist are alike in assuming that an opponent cannot be both honest and intelligent. Each of them tacitly claims that the truth has already been revealed, and that the heretic, if he is not simply a fool, is secretly aware of the truth and merely resists it out of selfish motives. In communist literature, the attack on individual liberty is usually masked by oratory about petty bourgeois individualism, the illusions of nineteenth-century liberalism, etc., and backed up by words of abuse such as romantic and sentimental, which, since they do not have any agreed meaning, are difficult to answer. In this way, the controversy is maneuvered away from its real issues. One can accept, and most enlightened people would accept, the communist thesis that pure freedom will only exist in a classless society, and that one is most nearly free when one is working to bring about such a society. But, slipped in with this, is the quite unfounded claim that the Communist Party is itself aiming at the establishment of the classless society, and that in the USSR this aim is actually on the way to being realized. If the first claim is allowed to entail the second, there is almost no assault on common sense and common decency that cannot be justified. But meanwhile, the real point has been dodged. Freedom of the intellect means the freedom to report what one has seen, heard, and felt, and not to be obliged to fabricate imaginary facts and feelings. The familiar tirades against escapism, individualism, romanticism, and so forth, are merely a forensic device, the aim of which is to make the perversion of history seem respectable. Fifteen years ago, when one defended the freedom of the intellect, one had to defend it against conservatives, against Catholics, and to some extent, for in England they were not of great importance, against fascists. Today, one has to defend it against communists and fellow travellers. One ought not to exaggerate the direct influence of the small English Communist Party.
But there can be no question about the poisonous effect of the Russian mythos on English intellectual life. Because of it, known facts are suppressed and distorted to such an extent as to make it doubtful whether a true history of our times can ever be written. Let me give just one instance out of the hundreds that could be cited. When Germany collapsed, it was found that very large numbers of Soviet Russians, mostly, no doubt, from non-political motives, had changed sides and were fighting for the Germans. Also, a small but not negligible proportion of the Russian prisoners and displaced persons refused to go back to the USSR, and some of them, at least, were repatriated against their will. These facts, known to many journalists on the spot, went almost unmentioned in the British press, while, at the same time, Russophile publicists in England continued to justify the purges and deportations of 1936-38 through 38 by claiming that the USSR had no quislings. The fog of lies and misinformation that surrounds such subjects as the Ukraine famine, the Spanish Civil War, Russian policy in Poland, and so forth, is not due entirely to conscious dishonesty, but any writer or journalist who is fully sympathetic to the USSR, sympathetic, that is, in the way the Russians themselves would want him to be, does have to acquiesce in deliberate falsification on important issues. I have before me what must be a very rare pamphlet, written by Maxim Litvinov in 1918, and outlining the recent events in the Russian Revolution. It makes no mention of Stalin, but gives high praise to Trotsky, and also to Zinoviev, Kamenev, and others. What could be the attitude of even the most intellectually scrupulous communist towards such a pamphlet? At best, he would take the obscurantist attitude that it is an undesirable document and better suppressed. And if, for some reason, it should be decided to issue a garbled version of the pamphlet, denigrating Trotsky and inserting references to Stalin, no communist who remained faithful to his party could protest. Forgeries almost as gross as this have been committed in recent years. But the significant thing is not that they happen, but that, even when they are known, they provoke no reaction from the left-wing intelligentsia as a whole. The argument that, to tell the truth, would be inopportune, or would play into the hands of somebody or other, is felt to be unanswerable, and few people are bothered by the prospect that the lies which they condone will get out of the newspapers and into the history books. The organized lying practiced by totalitarian states is not, as is sometimes claimed, a temporary expedient of the same nature as military deception. It is something integral to totalitarianism, something that would still continue even if concentration camps and secret police forces had ceased to be necessary. Among intelligent communists, there is an underground legend to the effect that although the Russian government is obliged now to deal in lying propaganda, frame up trials, and so forth, it is secretly recording the facts and will publish them at some future time. We can, I believe, be quite certain that this is not the case, because the mentality implied by such an action is that of a liberal historian who believes that the past cannot be altered and that a correct knowledge of history is valuable as a matter of course. From the totalitarian point of view, history is something to be created rather than learned. A totalitarian state is, in effect, a theocracy, and its ruling caste, in order to keep its position, has to be thought of as infallible. But since, in practice, no one is infallible, it is frequently necessary to rearrange past events in order to show that this or that mistake was not made, or that this or that imaginary triumph actually happened. Then, again, every major change in policy demands a corresponding change of doctrine and a re-evaluation of prominent historical figures. This kind of thing happens everywhere, but clearly 
it is likelier to lead to outright falsification in societies where only one opinion is permissible at any given moment. Totalitarianism demands, in fact, the continuous alteration of the past, and, in the long run, probably demands a disbelief in the very existence of objective truth. The friends of totalitarianism in this country usually tend to argue that since absolute truth is not attainable, a big lie is no worse than a little lie. It is pointed out that all historical records are biased and inaccurate, or, on the other hand, that modern physics has proved that what seemed to us the real world is an illusion, so that to believe in the evidence of one's senses is simply vulgar philistinism. A totalitarian society which succeeded in perpetuating itself would probably set up a schizophrenic system of thought in which the laws of common sense held good in everyday life and in certain exact sciences, but could be disregarded by the politician, the historian, and the sociologist. Already, there are countless people who would think it scandalous to falsify a scientific textbook, but would see nothing wrong in falsifying a historical fact. It is at the point where literature and politics cross that totalitarianism exerts its greatest pressure on the intellectual. The exact sciences are not, at this date, menaced to anything like the same extent. This difference partly accounts for the fact that in all countries it is easier for the scientists than for the writers to line up behind their respective governments. To keep the matter in perspective, let me repeat what I said at the beginning of this essay, that in England the immediate enemies of truthfulness, and hence of freedom of thought, are the press lords, the film magnates, and the bureaucrats, but that on a long view the weakening of the desire for liberty among the intellectuals themselves is the most serious symptom of all. It may seem that all this time I have been talking about the effects of censorship, not on literature as a whole, but merely on one department of political journalism. Granted that Soviet Russia constitutes a sort of forbidden area in the British press, granted that issues like Poland, the Spanish Civil War, the Russo-German Pact, and so forth, are debarred from serious discussion, and that if you possess information that conflicts with the prevailing orthodoxy, you are expected either to distort it or to keep quiet about it. Granted all this, why should literature in the wider sense be affected? Is every writer a politician, and is every book necessarily a work of straightforward reportage? Even under the tightest dictatorship, cannot the individual writer remain free inside his own mind and distill or disguise his unorthodox ideas in such a way that the authorities will be too stupid to recognize them? And if the writer himself is in agreement with the prevailing orthodoxy, why should it have a cramping effect on him? He is not literature, or any of the arts, likeliest to flourish in societies in which there are no major conflicts of opinion and no sharp distinctions between the artist and his audience. Does one have to assume that every writer is a rebel, or even that a writer as such is an exceptional person? Whenever one attempts to defend intellectual liberty against the claims of totalitarianism, one meets with these arguments in one form or another. They are based on a complete misunderstanding of what literature is, and how, one should perhaps rather say, why, it comes into being. They assume that a writer is either a mere entertainer, or else a venal hack, who can switch from one line of propaganda to another as easily as an organ grinder changes tunes. But, after all, how is it that books ever come to be written? Above quite a low level, Literature is an attempt to influence the views of one's contemporaries by recording experience. And so far as freedom of expression is concerned, there is not much difference between a mere journalist and the most unpolitical imaginative writer. The journalist is unfree, and is conscious of unfreedom when he is forced to write lies 
or suppress what seems to him important news. The imaginative writer is unfree when he has to falsify his subjective feelings, which, from his point of view, are facts. He may distort or caricature reality in order to make his meaning clearer, but he cannot misrepresent the scenery of his own mind. He cannot say with any conviction that he likes what he dislikes, or believes what he disbelieves. If he is forced to do so, the only result is that his creative faculties dry up. Nor can the imaginative writer solve the problem by keeping away from controversial topics. There is no such thing as genuinely non-political literature, and least of all in an age like our own, when fears, hatreds, and loyalties of a directly political kind are near to the surface of everyone's consciousness. Even a single taboo can have an all-round crippling effect upon the mind, because there is always the danger that any thought which is freely followed up may lead to the forbidden thought. It follows that the atmosphere of totalitarianism is deadly to any kind of prose writer, though a poet, at any rate a lyric poet, might possibly find it breathable. And in any totalitarian society that survives for more than a couple of generations, it is probable that prose literature, of the kind that has existed during the past four hundred years, must actually come to an end. Literature has sometimes flourished under despotic regimes, but, as has often been pointed out, the despotisms of the past were not totalitarian. Their repressive apparatus was always inefficient. Their ruling classes were usually either corrupt or apathetic or half-liberal in outlook, and the prevailing religious doctrines usually worked against perfectionism and the notion of human infallibility. Even so, it is broadly true that prose literature has reached the highest level in periods of democracy and free speculation. What is new in totalitarianism is that its doctrines are not only unchallengeable, but also unstable. They have to be accepted on pain of damnation, but on the other hand, they are always liable to be altered at a moment's notice. Consider, for example, the various attitudes, completely incompatible with one another, which an English communist or fellow traveller has had to adopt towards the war between Britain and Germany. For years before September 1939, he was expected to be in a continuous stew about the horrors of Nazism, and to twist everything he wrote into a denunciation of Hitler. After September 1939, for twenty months, he had to believe that Germany was more sinned against than sinning, and the word Nazi, at least so far as print went, had to drop right out of his vocabulary. Immediately after hearing the eight o'clock news bulletin on the morning of June 22nd, 1941, he had to start believing once again that Nazism was the most hideous evil the world had ever seen. Now, it is easy for a politician to make such changes. For a writer, the case is somewhat different. If he is to switch his allegiance at exactly the right moment, he must either tell lies about his subjective feelings, or else suppress them altogether. In either case, he has destroyed his dynamo. Not only will ideas refuse to come to him, but the very words he uses will seem to stiffen under his touch. Political writing in our time consists almost entirely of prefabricated phrases bolted together like the pieces of a child's Meccano set. It is the unavoidable result of self-censorship. To write in plain, vigorous language, one has to think fearlessly, and if one thinks fearlessly, one cannot be politically orthodox. It might be otherwise in an age of faith, when the prevailing orthodoxy has been long established and is not taken too seriously. In that case, it would be possible, or might be possible, for large areas of one's mind to remain unaffected by what one officially believed. Even so, it is worth noticing that prose literature almost disappeared during the only age of faith 
that Europe has ever enjoyed. Throughout the whole of the Middle Ages, there was almost no imaginative prose literature and very little in the way of historical writing, and the intellectual leaders of society expressed their most serious thoughts in a dead language which barely altered during a thousand years. Totalitarianism, however, does not so much promise an age of faith as an age of schizophrenia. A society becomes totalitarian when its structure becomes flagrantly artificial. That is, when its ruling class has lost its function but succeeds in clinging to power by force or fraud. Such a society, no matter how long it persists, can never afford to become either tolerant or intellectually stable. It can never permit either the truthful recording of facts or the emotional sincerity that literary creation demands. But to be corrupted by totalitarianism, one does not have to live in a totalitarian country. The mere prevalence of certain ideas can spread a poison that makes one subject after another impossible for literary purposes. Whenever there is an enforced orthodoxy, or even two orthodoxies, as often happens, good writing stops. This was well illustrated by the Spanish Civil War. To many English intellectuals, the war was a deeply moving experience, but not an experience about which they could write sincerely. There were only two things that you were allowed to say, and both of them were palpable lies. As a result, the war produced acres of print, but almost nothing worth reading. It is not certain whether the effects of totalitarianism upon verse need be so deadly as its effect on prose. There is a whole series of converging reasons why it is somewhat easier for a poet than for a prose writer to feel at home in an authoritarian society. To begin with, bureaucrats and other practical men usually despise the poet too deeply to be much interested in what he is saying. Secondly, what the poet is saying, that is, what his poem means, if translated into prose, is relatively unimportant even to himself. The thought contained in a poem is always simple, and is no more the primary purpose of the poem than the anecdote is the primary purpose of a picture. A poem is an arrangement of sounds and associations, as a painting is an arrangement of brush marks. For short snatches, Indeed, as in the refrain of a song, poetry can even dispense with meaning altogether. It is therefore fairly easy for a poet to keep away from dangerous subjects and avoid uttering heresies, and even when he does utter them, they may escape notice. But, above all, good verse, unlike good prose, is not necessarily an individual product. Certain kinds of poems such as ballads, or, on the other hand, very artificial verse forms, can be composed cooperatively by groups of people. Whether the ancient English and Scottish ballads were originally produced by individuals, or by the people at large, is disputed. But, at any rate, they are non-individual in the sense that they constantly change in passing from mouth to mouth. Even in print, no two versions of a ballad are ever quite the same. Many primitive peoples compose verse communally. Someone begins to improvise, probably accompanying himself on a musical instrument. Somebody else chips in with a line or a rhyme when the first singer breaks down, and so the process continues until there exists a whole song or ballad which has no identifiable author. In prose, this kind of intimate collaboration is quite impossible. Serious prose, in any case, has to be composed in solitude, whereas the excitement of being part of a group is actually an aid to certain kinds of versification. Verse, and perhaps good verse of its kind, though it would not be the highest kind, might survive under even the most inquisitorial regime. Even in a society, where liberty and individuality had been extinguished, there would still be need, either for patriotic songs and heroic ballads celebrating victories, 
or for elaborate exercises in flattery, and these are the kinds of poetry that can be written to order, or composed communally, without necessarily lacking artistic value. Prose is a different matter, since the prose writer cannot narrow the range of his thoughts without killing his inventiveness. But the history of totalitarian societies, or of groups of people who have adopted the totalitarian outlook, suggests that loss of liberty is inimical to all forms of literature. German literature almost disappeared during the Hitler regime, and the case was not much better in Italy. Russian literature, so far as one can judge by translations, has deteriorated markedly since the early days of the revolution, though some of the verse appears to be better than the prose. Few, if any, Russian novels that it is possible to take seriously have been translated for about fifteen years. In Western Europe and America, large sections of the literary intelligentsia have either passed through the Communist Party or been warmly sympathetic to it, but this whole leftward movement has produced extraordinarily few books worth reading. Orthodox Catholicism, again, seems to have a crushing effect upon certain literary forms, especially the novel. During a period of three hundred years, how many people have been at once good novelists and good Catholics? The fact is that certain themes cannot be celebrated in words, and tyranny is one of them. No one ever wrote a good book in praise of the Inquisition. Poetry might survive in a totalitarian age, and certain arts, or half-arts, such as architecture, might even find tyranny beneficial, but the prose writer would have no choice between silence and death. Prose literature, as we know it, is the product of rationalism, of the Protestant centuries, of the autonomous individual. And the destruction of intellectual liberty cripples the journalist, the sociological writer, the historian, the novelist, the critic, and the poet, in that order. In the future, it is possible that a new kind of literature, not involving individual feeling or truthful observation, may arise, but no such thing is at present imaginable. It seems much likelier that if the liberal culture that we have lived in since the Renaissance actually comes to an end, the literary art will perish with it. Of course, print will continue to be used, and it is interesting to speculate what kinds of reading matter would survive in a rigidly totalitarian society. Newspapers will presumably continue until television technique reaches a higher level, but, apart from newspapers, it is doubtful even now whether the great mass of people in the industrialized countries feel the need for any kind of literature. They are unwilling, at any rate, to spend anywhere near as much on reading matter as they spend on several other recreations. Probably novels and stories will be completely superseded by film and radio productions. Or perhaps some kind of low-grade sensational fiction will survive, produced by a sort of conveyor belt process that reduces human initiative to the minimum. It would probably not be beyond human ingenuity to write books by machinery. But a sort of mechanizing process can already be seen at work in the film and radio, in publicity and propaganda, and in the lower reaches of journalism. The Disney films, for instance, are produced by what is essentially a factory process, the work being done partly mechanically and partly by teams of artists who have to subordinate their individual style. Radio features are commonly written by tired hacks to whom the subject and the manner of treatment are dictated beforehand. Even so, what they write is merely a kind of raw material to be chopped into shape by producers and censors. So also with the innumerable books and pamphlets commissioned by government departments. Even more machine-like is the production of short stories, serials, and poems for the very cheap magazines. Papers such as The Writer abound with advertisements of literary schools, all of them offering you ready-made plots at a few shillings a time. Some, together with the plot, 
supply the opening and closing sentences of each chapter. Others furnish you with a sort of algebraical formula by the use of which you can construct your plots for yourself. Others offer packs of cards marked with characters and situations, which have only to be shuffled and dealt in order to produce ingenious stories automatically. It is probably in some such way that the literature of a totalitarian society would be produced if literature were still felt to be necessary. Imagination, even consciousness, so far as possible, would be eliminated from the process of writing. Books would be planned in their broad lines by bureaucrats, and would pass through so many hands that when finished they would be no more an individual product than a Ford car at the end of the assembly line. It goes without saying that anything so produced would be rubbish. But anything that was not rubbish would endanger the structure of the state. As for the surviving literature of the past, it would have to be suppressed, or at least elaborately rewritten. Meanwhile, totalitarianism has not fully triumphed anywhere. Our own society is still, broadly speaking, liberal. To exercise your right of free speech, you have to fight against economic pressure and against strong sections of public opinion, but not, as yet, against a secret police force. You can say or print almost anything so long as you are willing to do it in a hole-and-corner way. But what is sinister, as I said at the beginning of this essay, is that the conscious enemies of liberty are those to whom liberty ought to mean most. The public do not care about the matter, one way or the other. They are not in favour of persecuting the heretic, and they will not exert themselves to defend him. They are at once too sane and too stupid to acquire the totalitarian outlook. The direct, conscious attack on intellectual decency comes from the intellectuals themselves. It is possible that the Russophile intelligentsia, if they had not succumbed to that particular myth, would have succumbed to another of much the same kind. But, at any rate, the Russian myth is there, and the corruption it causes stinks. When one sees highly educated men looking on indifferently at oppression and persecution, one wonders which to despise more, their cynicism or their short-sightedness. Many scientists, for example, are uncritical admirers of the USSR. They appear to think that the destruction of liberty is of no importance as long as their own line of work is, for the moment, unaffected. The USSR is a large, rapidly developing country which has acute need of scientific workers and, consequently, treats them generously. Provided that they steer clear of dangerous subjects, such as psychology, scientists are privileged persons. Writers, on the other hand, are viciously persecuted. It is true that literary prostitutes, like Ilya Ehrenberg or Alexei Tolstoy, are paid huge sums of money, but the only thing which is of any value to the writer as such, his freedom of expression, is taken away from him. Some, at least, of the English scientists, who speak so enthusiastically of the opportunities enjoyed by scientists in Russia, are capable of understanding this. But their reflection appears to be, Writers are persecuted in Russia. So what? I am not a writer. They do not see that any attack on intellectual liberty and on the concept of objective truth threatens in the long run every department of thought. For the moment, the totalitarian state tolerates the scientist because it needs him. Even in Nazi Germany, scientists, other than Jews, were relatively well treated, and the German scientific community, as a whole, offered no resistance to Hitler. At this stage of history, even the most autocratic ruler is forced to take account of physical reality, partly because of the lingering on of liberal habits of thought, partly because of the need to prepare for war. So long as physical reality cannot be altogether ignored, 
so long as two and two have to make four when you are, for example, drawing the blueprint of an aeroplane, the scientist has his function, and can even be allowed a measure of liberty. His awakening will come later, when the totalitarian state is firmly established. Meanwhile, if he wants to safeguard the integrity of science, it is his job to develop some kind of solidarity with his literary colleagues, and not regard it as a matter of indifference when writers are silenced or driven to suicide and newspapers systematically falsified. But, however it may be with the physical sciences, or with music, painting, and architecture, it is, as I have tried to show, certain that literature is doomed if liberty of thought perishes. Not only is it doomed in any country which retains a totalitarian structure, but any writer who adopts the totalitarian outlook, who finds excuses for persecution and the falsification of reality, thereby destroys himself as a writer. There is no way out of this. No tirades against individualism and the ivory tower. No pious platitudes to the effect that true individuality is only attained through identification with the community can get over the fact that a bought mind is a spoiled mind. Unless spontaneity enters at some point or other, literary creation is impossible, and language itself becomes ossified. At some time in the future, if the human mind becomes something totally different from what it is now, we may learn to separate literary creation from intellectual honesty. At present, we know only that the imagination, like certain wild animals, will not breed in captivity. Any writer or journalist who denies that fact, and nearly all the current praise of the Soviet Union contains or implies such a denial, is, in effect, demanding his own destruction.